Yeah, so, so this talk is uh, it's somewhat thematically related to, um, to Monday's talk in that we're, we're still going to be using tools from primarily algebraic geometry, uh, although no longer so much algebraic topology, okay, <clears throat> for problems in uh, things like uh, in incidence combinatorics or related. Related topics. By the way, there's going to be an IPAM program on this, on, on exactly on algebraic geomet geometric applications to combinatorics uh, at uh, the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics at UCLA next year, 2014. If you're interested, uh, it's been organized by Nets Katz, uh, Jordan Ellenberg, and Mika Sharia. <clears throat> okay, so um, on Monday we, we saw um, one such application on, on ordinary lines um, using what you might call 19th century. Algebraic geometry and algebraic topology. You know, we, we use the um, from, from algebraic geometry. We use the cayley baccarat theorem, which is a 19th century result. Uh, on the algebraic topology side, we used Euler's formula, which I guess is an 18th century result. Um, we also use this Poon and Rubenstein theorem, which is a 20th century result. So, on the average, 19th century um, <laughs> techniques were used. Uh, so uh, today, this will be more using um, uh, 20th century algebraic geometry. Uh, yeah, in, in particular, or first of all, I, I, I need the Langlois estimates. And the Atal van Menno group. Um, we won't be using algebraic topology much. Uh, so thus far, uh, algebraic topology has only been useful for combinatorial problems over the reals or complexes. Um, over finite fields, which is where this problem is going to be stated, uh, we don't seem to have topological methods, although you could argue maybe the, the Atal van Menno group is some sort of substitute for, for an algebraic topological op object. Okay. So, um, what is the problem? Ah, I already didn't get okay, right. Um, okay, so the, um, um, so the problem is going to be over a finite field. So, you let F be a finite field, I think as, as a large finite field. You can make a prime order if you wish, or you can make it a prime power order. Um, and we're going to take a polynomial. Of two variables. Um, of bounded degree. Okay, like degree to quadratic or cubic or something. Okay, but the field is much larger than the degree. Um, and we want to know uh, which polynomials are expanding. So I'll, I'll give an informal definition. We say that a polynomial is expanding. If uh, for all sets, for all subsets A and B of the finite field, uh, except for ones that are too small, too large. So um, to give it some, some degenerate cases, we assume that, that uh, the sets have si don't have bounded size and they don't have, they don't, they don't have size close to F. So they have some intermediate size between, between one and the size of the field. Um, if you form the image of, of, of um, of uh, A and B under this polynomial, which by definition is just P of A comma B, where A is an A and B is an B. Um, we say that a polynomial is expanding if no matter what two sets you, you stick in, P of AB is, is substantially bigger than either A or B. Um, okay. So if, if you have um, some sort of bound like this, um, then we say that your polynomial is expanding, that, uh, that the, 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 um, the polynomial gives you a, a, a bigger output set than, than, than input sets. Now, this is not a precise definition because I haven't quantified exactly um, what bigger than means and what, what hypotheses there are. There's various types of, of expansion depending on, on what regimes uh, you're, you're interested in and what bounds you, you expect to get. So uh, the, I, I won't list, you know, there's like six different inequivalent types of expansion, but this is a, sort of a rough definition and these are, these are useful in, in computer science um, for constructing um, uh, things like uh, randomness extractors, and you can also build certain types of expander graphs uh, using these expanding polynomials. Um, I won't talk about applications here. Um, I just think of this as a, as a pure mathematical problem, which is to, to understand which polynomials are expanding. Okay, so the basic question is... is
Okay, so this is not a well-defined question yet because I, I haven't precisely defined expansion, but for each precise definition of expansion, you can formulate a problem like this. So um, to, to sort of answer this question, we, we can first give some examples of polynomials that don't expand. Okay, so don't expand polynomials. Okay, so a very simple example of a, of a non-expanding polynomial is the, is the addition polynomial x plus y, uh, because for this polynomial you can take x, uh, you can take a to be some arithmetic progression, for example, the standard arithmetic progression of some length n, and b to be the same progression. And uh, in this case, p of a b. is only about twice as long as A, as a or B. So um, at least for this particular type of set, you don't get expansion. And these progressions can be, have length anywhere, any length between one and F. Of course, at the, at the extremes, um, you can't get expansion. Like if A and B are both of one element, then PAB is one element. There's no expansion in, in this end. And if A and B are the whole set, then, then PAB can't get bigger than the whole set either. So expansion is only interesting in the mid-range. So addition is not a, um, an expanding polynomial. Uh, more generally, any function, any polynomial uh, function of x plus y, say x plus y or squared, is also not expanding for the same reason. You stick in um, uh, two progressions of the same spacing and you'll get out a, a, just an image of a progression of, of, of about the same size. So this, this is also not an expanding polynomial. Um, a little bit more generally, any polynomial which has this structure, so uh, for example, x squared plus x plus y cubed minus y, or cubed plus the same thing. Okay, so this polynomial of two variables is also not expanding because uh, you can take, in, in this case, you take a to be the, the inverse image of some generic uh, ethnic progression and, uh, and b to be the inverse image of the same progression. Um, or a translate of the progression. And if you, ch if you choose these projections ra um, progressions randomly, um, A and B will have roughly the same size as the progression itself. And if you, if you stick it in, you'll find that P of A, B also has, oh, I shouldn't use P. Um, I can't use Q either. Oh, right. uh, okay. um, you, you can just compute that P of A, B will have about the same size as A and B. So this is an example of a polynomial that doesn't expand. And uh, very similarly, If you take a polynomial which has this form, which is the same thing except for where you replace addition here by multiplication, um, then again you don't have expansion. It's the same argument, but you replace arithmetic progressions by geometric progressions. Okay, so these are examples of polynomials that don't expand, um, and the general conjecture is that um, at least for fields of prime order, um, these should be the only non-expanding polynomials. So any pol so. Most polynomials cannot be written in this form. Most, as a general rule, functions of two variables generally cannot be written in terms of functions of one variable. Um, but, um, okay, so, this, um, I mean, there's a lot of polynomials of this type, but they're still very uh, sparse compared to the space of all polynomials. And so the expectation is that most polynomials do not exp uh, are expanding, uh, and in particular, any ones that are not of, of this type. Now, um, I, this is, at least for fields of, of prime order, um, <coughs> There is this one further obstruction which is very annoying. Um, if your field does not have a prime order, then it contains subfields. And because there are subfields, there's further, there are further examples. Um, so if your field contains a subfield, um, and your polynomial takes coefficients in the subfield, uh, then you're not going to be expanding because then P of, you just insert in the subfield. and you can't escape the subfield. Uh, so you don't get expansion in that case. Um, so that's kind of annoying. Um, and, and you can concoct many variants of this example, and so it's much less obvious what to conjecture is true uh, in, in that case. Uh, so people generally do one of two things. Um, one is either restrict attention to, to fields of prime order, in which so that this problem doesn't occur, uh, or the other is to restrict attention to sets that are so large that they can't fit inside subfields. Um, so um, to deal with this problem, uh, one way around it is to restrict attention to sets that are large. Um, so large can mean various things. Um, the sort of 
the minimal defin definition of large should be bigger than f to the one half because that's that's big enough to the largest subfield that a, a field can have is of, is of index two, is of, is of f to the one half. So if you're bigger than f to the one half, you can't get stuck inside a subfield. Um, and the, the work I'll be doing, I can't get quite that low. Uh, I'll be I'll be studying things that are quite that are quite big uh, of size about f to the fifteen sixteenths or bigger. Um, but so there's, there's various regimes in which you can study expansion. You can study expansion for very large sets, sets that are close to F. Um, very small sets is also very interesting, sets less than F to the epsilon, and then the, and then the, the medium range sets, and, and they, they each have a different theory. Um, it turns out that the, the large sets are actually the easiest to study, and what I'll, I'll talk about today is basically a complete solution to classifying the non-expanding polynomials in, uh, in, the large, uh, in the large case, uh, with one caveat. Um, I can't handle all, all finite fields but I can find out if there's a large characteristic. Um, though this is probably a technical problem primarily. It's, 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 uh, it's primarily a lack of my algebraic geometry knowledge of algebraic geometry and finite characteristic. Uh, but, well, it's not just that. There, there seem to be some serious issues in, 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 in positive characteristic. Um, okay, so... Uh, before I state my theorem, let me say it's, uh, there's a, there's a, so this problem has been studied. This general problem has been studied by many, many people. Um, not just in, so I stated it were finite fields, but you can also ask analogous questions of other fields like R and C and the rationals and so forth. Um, and in these fields, uh, we have a lot more progress. Basically, uh, if, if your field has something to do with the reals, then um, then topological methods come back into play. Um, so. Um, there's, uh, okay, so there are several results in, in, over, um, in these fields. So in R, for example, there was a result of, uh, of Elakesh, Elakesh and um, how come I don't have the other author named? Oh, that's embarrassing. Um, yeesh. Oh, dear. Um, one year. Okay, so uh, Elikesh and, and Ronier uh, in, in R, uh, what they showed, roughly speaking, is that if, if your polynomial P is now a polynomial of the reals, and it is not of one of these two forms. Okay. So it's a, it's a polynomial of bounded degree but not, of, uh, but not decomposable in, in, in this way. And you take two sets, two sets of, of real numbers now, let's say of size n, then what they showed is that then you get some amount of expansion that um, you're bounded by some multiple of n where this multiple goes to infinity, as n goes to infinity. Okay, so as the bigger and bigger sets you have, you get some expansion. Uh, they didn't quantify exactly what expansion rate, uh, but they, they did get some expansion. Um, and these sets cannot be arbitrarily large. Of course, in finite fields, you, you can't get larger than the size of the field, but, but over R, there, there, was, there was no restriction. So over the reals, at least, uh, you get the right result, that, that these, are, these are the only, um, these polynomials are the only non-expanding polynomials. Um, and then later on, Elikesh and Zabo, uh, Basically, prove the same thing for, for, for um, prove the same thing for the complex numbers. Essentially, the same result. Um, and very recently, uh, Solomoshi uh, proved a similar result for the rationals. Uh, now, you may think, um, the, if you can understand what's going on for the reals, that, by, that this, this, this necessarily tells you, if, if you can prove expansion in the reals, you can prove expansion sorry, in the rationals, which is certainly true. But there are some polynomials that um, that don't expand. Um, in the reals, but they do expand over the rationals. Uh, for example, um, uh, okay, yeah, okay. For a simple example is a, is a polynomial like this. Um, okay, that's, that's, not, that's not definable the rationals. I have to think of a better example. Um, ah, okay, here we go. X squared plus Y squared. Okay, yeah, this polynomial doesn't expand over the reals uh, because you can take the square root of a progression, of an algebraic progression. Uh, and stick it in, and it doesn't expand over the reals, but it does expand over, over the rationals, as it turns out. So um, there's, there's some additional number theory issues that he had to resolve to, to sort out what was going on in, 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 uh, in, in the rationals. 
So um, we have a fairly good understanding of what's going on um, over fields that are related to R, basically because we can use techniques coming from algebraic topology. Uh, so uh, for, the, for the experts, this involves things like the, the zemmerdi trotter theorem, uh, crossing number inequalities, um, ultimately, which ultimately boil down to things, things like Euler's formula and, and think, the things that are only available uh, over R, basically. Cell decomposition is also a, a major tool. Okay, but I won't talk about these, uh, these results, which are very nice. Uh, they, they do a lot of algebraic topology to get some initial reductions, and then they have to solve some algebraic geometry question problem to, uh, to, to, to get into, into, into this final form, assuming that you don't expand. Okay, so I'll I'll be, I'll be interested in working with finite fields, and as I said, there's sort of these two regimes, one where a, you, you're large, and then one where you're small, you know, less than f, f to one half, say, or, or f to one Epsilon. And so there's been a lot of work uh, in the small case. Um, uh, expansion for polynomials for, uh, for small sets is, is related to something called the sum product phenomenon. It's roughly speaking saying that, that addition alone doesn't expand and multiplication alone doesn't expand, but any sort of non-trivial combination of addition and multiplication expands. Uh, that's sort of the rough... Uh, statement of a sum product phenomenon. Uh, there's many different ways to formalize it. So there's been a lot of work on this uh, by a lot of authors. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, Bourguin, Garayev, Hartley, Shen, and Solomoshi, and many, many other people have worked on the small case. Um, there's also been a lot of work on the, on the large case. There are, um, people have constructed specific examples of polynomials that do expand. Uh, so for example, um, Bourguin, for instance, showed that, uh, that if you take this polynomial or this, uh, or this polynomial or this polynomial, um, these guys have, have, have expansion for, for large A and B. That, that, uh, actually, uh, for these particular polynomials, actually, uh, Bourguin showed expansion both for large and small. Um, so uh, he showed things like if, uh, if A and B uh, is of size between f to the epsilon and f to one minus epsilon, then you can show that PAB is bigger than, say, uh, the minimum of, of A and B to the one plus delta for some delta that depends on this epsilon here. Okay, so they, uh, they gave expi um, explicit examples, this is these are examples of Bourguin, of polynomials that have expansion. Um, oh, actually, no, this is not quite right. Um, PA, um, for him, uh, he did the symmetric case, actually. Oh, yeah, so there's, there's something called asymmetric expansion where you have A and B and the symmetric expansion where you have A and A. Uh, okay, he actually showed examples of, of symmetric expansion. It's, it's, these are technical distinctions. They're not so terribly um, relevant. Okay. Um, <clears throat> It's also been worked by Solomoshi and Yosevich Rudnev, uh, Shkredov, Gareyev, and uh, Hartley and Shen. Um, one result of this type, which I want to mention, is there's a result of Vu, uh, which proves something similar. That he, he said that if you have a polynomial which is not, um, which is not of the form Q of AX plus BY, so if it doesn't come from, from a linear form, um, then he was able to, sh to show an expansion result, not just a P well, uh, he, he, not just a PAA, but but a dichotomy PAA or A plus A is bigger than if A to one plus delta if A is between. Okay, so for a, a medium-sized set, you get either some expansion of PAA or A plus A. One of the two expands, as long as PAA is not a self-look coming from an additive structure. So that's, that's uh, actually, I think he, he was only able to do uh, half, above one half. Uh, okay, below one half, you get subfields uh, obstructing you. Um, okay, and then um, finally, um, there was a recent result of Buch and Zimmerman. Uh, 
uh, that show that if, if P is um, non-composite, so that means that it's, it's not of the, it doesn't factor by some polynomial or some other polynomial, but there's no non-trivial factorization of this form, um, and it's not of the form of the additive or obligative form. And if it's monic in X and in Y, uh, which means that it's, it's of the form X to the D plus something else where the X is only appear to, to degree D minus one or less and Y to various powers. Okay, so um, the, the, um, the, um, uh, there's only one X to the D component and it's, it's just a monic polynomial X to the D and similarly for Y. So there's also some Y to the, the L on the other side and every other power of Y is strictly less than L. If it's monic in both variables, non-composite and not of this form, uh, then they were able to show uh, an expansion result like this. Uh, I think uh, I think they were looking at PAA again. Yeah, so A is sufficiently large. I forget exactly what power, but uh, uh, I think they can get up to one eighth, one fourth, one. Okay get exactly. Um, but they were able to show some expansion uh, in this particular case. One minus uh, One, yes, 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 thank you. Okay. Um, all right, so now I can take my theorem. Um, so my theorem is that, uh, so let the P be bound a degree, and assume that the, the field, the characteristic of the field is sufficiently large, depending on its degree. And P is not of one of these two forms. So this is not of the form uh, Q f of x plus G of y, or Q f of x times G of y. Uh, then you have expansion in the following sense that, um, in fact, P A B is always, in fact, of size f. Compared to f, uh, whenever A and B are large, and the correct notion of large actually is f to the 2 minus 1 eighth times a large constant, C is large enough. So there's a certain threshold where if A and B, the product of the size of A and B is, is big enough, um, then uh, in fact PAB has to saturate almost the entire, um, almost the entire field. Um, you don't necessarily get the entire field. Um, so you don't necessarily saturate from the, the, the entire field. For example, P could be a perfect square. It could be a square of another polynomial uh, and still not of this form, in which case you can only get the quadratic residues. You can't get the quadratic non-residues. So you can't hope to get every single uh, element, but you can hope to get a, a, a constant fraction. Okay, so this is, this is one of my theorems. There are analogous things for the symmetric expansion and, and things like that. And uh, I do have a partial characterization of when you expect to get almost all the entire field and so forth. Uh, it, 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 uh, it's not a completely satisfactory uh, characterization because there's some algebraic geometry question I can't solve, but uh, maybe I'll talk about that at the very end. Okay, but uh, this basically tells you that these are the only obstructions to expansion, at least in the large characteristic case. Okay, so I want to talk about how, how this is proved. Um, so there's, there's several steps in the proof. Um, there's, there's one first, there's a technical step first, which comes from model theory. Um, so for technical reasons, this, this type of statement is, is a quantitative statement. About finite fields. Of large characteristic. So it turns out that there's a way to convert this, there's a correspondence principle that converts this type of, uh, any statement of this form, roughly speaking, can be converted to an equivalent statement, which is a, a qualitative statement. About, um, among the finite fields, it's called a pseudo-finite field. Of zero characteristic. Um, so a pseudo-finite field is a field that can be infinite, uh, but it obeys the same sort of uh, properties as a finite field. So a finite field, for instance, has a Frobenius automorphism, which uh, generates the Gower, its absolute Gower group. 
Um, and pseudo-finite also have a Frobenius map, which also uh, generates the, the, the absolute uh, Galois group, and things like that. Um, so th there's this tool to do this. Uh, basically, if, if you use something called an ultra product, or if you like non-set analysis, there's a general machine for model theory that, that equates quantitative statements, things with bounds, uh, to uh, qualitative statements in which you don't care about the, the bounds of various things anymore, um, but things still have to be finite um, about, about pseudo-finite fields. Now, this is, um, I won't talk much about this reduction. It's, it's not actually all that substantial, but it's, um, it's very necessary for the argument because I, I will need zero characteristic to do a lot of, of later things. Um, so the upshot basically is that, is that you should think of large characteristic as being sort of like zero characteristic for, for what, I'm, uh, what I'm doing. Um, Okay, so this, if you like, I'm sort of, sort of secretly using the left shed principle everywhere. Um, okay, so this is a technical step which I don't want to talk that much further about. <clears throat> All right. Um, now, um, one way to think about this, this, this sort of statement um, is that uh, it's, it, there's an equivalent formulation in, involving um, this graph. So if you graph the polynomial, um, then you get the subset of F3. So you get some, some it doesn't actually look like this, but okay. You, you, um, you get some, you, uh, you get some, some two-dimensional um, subset of, of, of F3. And um, you can phrase this sort of question. In, um, what you're really doing is that you're, you're trying to understand how, um, how um, this, this, this set um, interacts with Cartesian products. That if you, can, if you can get a good sense, if you can get a good estimate on how uh, this, this, this set uh, interacts with, with Cartesian with these triple Cartesian products, uh, it, you can convert that to, 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 to estimates of this form. Um, so what, what you'd really like to do is, is you want to get bounds on, on the set like this. Um, and heuristically, because this set, has, has, this set should have size about F, F squared inside F cubed, so if you take a, a, a typical uh, Cartesian product here, you expect the ex expectation is that the size of this intersection for typical ABC should be of the size plus some, some, some error term. Okay. And if you can prove an estimate of this form then, uh, of the right type, then you should be able to prove an estimate like this. So you want to show that, that graphs of this type have some sort of um, what graph theorists uh, uh, call regularity. Um, or, or quasi-randomness, uh, that, 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 that these, this set, which you can think of not as a graph because it, it has three um, coordinates, but as what's called a three-uniform hypergraph, but it's sort of a graph. It's a graph connecting triples of, of points rather than, than pairs. But you want this graph to be, to, be, to be random in some sense, in the sense that, that its intersection with large, um, large pro products has sort of the expected um, density. So you want some sort of a regularity theorem that tells you um, things like this. So, um, so the main tool I use to do this is what I call an, an algebraic regularity lemma. Which I actually view as sort of the, 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 the real theorem in, in, in the paper. These are just some applications of the algebraic regularity lemma. So the statement, actually, before I set the lemma, I, need, I needed some notation. So I'm going to do it over here. OK, so I need the notion of a definable set. OK, so um, so over a finite field, um, a definable set is a set of the form. It's a set of all points in some power of the, the finite field which obey some, some first order predicate. So it's like, well, P of X is true. And uh, this is some um, um, first order sentence, first order predicate. In the language of fields. Uh, with constants uh, in F. 
Okay, so it's just any sentence with for all and there exists and constants and variables and plus and times and things like that. Um, and anything like this is called a definable set. So for instance, um, any algebraic variety over F is a, is a definable set. Um, the set of quadratic residues. set, and so on and so forth. Now, as written, uh, this is a silly concept because if f is finite, every set is definable. Um, so to make, that, to, to make this uh, more useful, you can either work with pseudo-finite fields, or you can work, um, that's a qual qualitative way of doing things, or you can work with definable sets of bounded complexity. Of complexity at most m. So that's a, that's a set of this form where the dimensions at most m and this predicate has length at most, at most m, okay, where every symbol gets, gets length one. So this would be a, 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 a definable set of complexity, I don't know, seven or something. Um, okay, so these are definable sets of some bounded complexity. Okay, so here's the regularity lemma. So let V and W, so uh, let F be a finite field. Okay, so hang on. let M be a number, let F be a finite field of sufficiently large characteristic, depending on M. Uh, let V and W be definable over F of complexity at most M. And consider a graph between V and W, which means a subset of V cross W, also definable of complexity at most M. So a definable graph between definable sets. Um, then I can always make this, this graph regular. Okay, so then the theorem is that there exists a partition V splits into V1 up to, say, Vn. Uh, w splits into W1, Wm. Uh, these numbers are bounded by something that depending only on the complexity. Uh, these sets are also definable with some, comp with some bound of complexity, and they're pretty big. Um, VI, each VI has size like one of, they all have positive density. The density is bounded away from zero by some bound depending on, on the complexity, such that uh, for all um, VI and WJ, um, the set E is regular inside each pair. Uh, in the following sense, for all VI and WJ, there exists um, a density alpha IJ, which is a real number. In fact, it's even a rational number whose height is controlled by the complexity, although I don't actually need that fact. Um, so there's some density. Sorry. So that for all A and V i and V and V j, um, the density of E inside, v cross, uh, inside A cross B is alpha uh, plus an error. Error turns out to be one quarter. F minus one quarter, V i, W j. Okay, so what this is saying is that I can split up any definable graph between definable sets into a bounded number of pieces, where on each piece um, the graph has is regular with some density, but the density can vary from piece to piece. So um, for graph theorists, this is very similar in spirit to something called the Zimmer-Reddy regularity lemma, which is a very fundamental lemma in graph theory, which says that any graph, not definable, just any large graph can be split up into a bounded number of pieces where, each, where most of the pieces are regular. Um, this is very much in that spirit, uh, but it's, it's, so it has a stronger hypothesis in that we have this definability hypothesis and a stronger conclusion. Um, the normal regularity lemma of Zemmeretti gets most pairs regular. This gets all pairs regular. And the error term in Zemmeretti's regularity lemma is very, very weak. Uh, you, you only, there's an inverse tower exponential involved in the bound. It's, 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 a, it's a very, very weak bound. This is a, a polynomial type bound in, in the size. So it's, it's, a, it's a much stronger bound, which is, which is, uh, which is why we get these polynomial type, type results here. So before I talk about this lemma, let me give some examples. So, um, so for example, you can take V and W to be a finite field, and E can be what's, what, for example, the, uh, what's called a Paley graph. So of all V and W in F plus F, whose difference is a quadratic residue. 
Okay, so you take all the, the pairs of vertices that differ by quadratic residue, it's called the, the, the Paley graph. And a very nice application of Fourier analysis shows that uh, this graph is regular in the sense that E is the second e product. This has density one half, and you, you can easily show that this is equal to one half. AB has an error which is um, you gain one half over the trivial bound because uh, of uh, basically quadratic Gauss sums that are size f to minus one half. Okay, so that, which is a very nice application of Fourier analysis. So in, in, in this case, you don't need to regularize, uh, into, you, don't, you don't need to decompose into pieces. Your, your graph is already regular without any decomposition. Um, another example is, this, is the same graph, but you replace this minus sign by a product. So instead of taking the pairs or set of all points whose difference is a quadratic residue, you take the set of all points whose product is a quadratic residue. That's also a definable graph, bound to complexity. But now um, it's not random in the sense, it's still density one half, but uh, what it looks like is that if you split V into the quadratic residues and the non-residues, and W into the quadratic residues and non-residues, the graph looks like this. It has density one on this block and density zero on, on, on these blocks. But it still obeys the, the conclusion of this lemma because if you decompose V into, into these two pieces and W into these two pieces, on each pair of pieces, you have the regularity. Um, so roughly speaking, um, this lemma is saying that any definable graph looks like some combination of these two examples that I just said. Okay, these are sort of the only two types of algebraic behaviors you can have. Okay. Now, this lemma basically, uh, so why does lemma give you this theorem? Um, it doesn't directly give you this theorem because um, these regularity lemmas are only useful when your, your graph E is very dense. Um, um, otherwise, the error terms here just overwhelm the main terms. Um, you, you want your, your set E to be of size about V times W. Um, and this set here, um, for the application that, that uh, here, um, it's, it's sparse. It's, it's F squared as a component compared to F cubed. So you can't use this regular lemma directly. But there's a trick. Uh, if you, you can play with this expression and you apply Cauchy Schwartz twice, as it turns out. And after playing on a Cauchy Schwartz, you can basically, the, the upshot of Cauchy Schwartz is that you replace this, this set with a slightly different set. So those of you who know what the Galois norms are, that this is the same trick used in the theory of the Galois norms. Um, so this is a slightly different set, which is, uh, which is uh, sort of what you get when you apply cauchy schwartz this curve twice, and I'm not going to define exactly what that means. But um, this is a set now in four dimensions, which should have positive density because it, it, it's, it, it's parameterized with, with four unknowns in, 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 in inside a four-dimensional space. So you expect it to have positive density. And if it does have positive density, you can apply this regularity lemma to this set, and then after undoing the Cauchy-Schwartz, you can get what you want. Um, and for most polynomials, um, this set is indeed four-dimensional. But there are a few exceptional polynomials for which uh, this, uh, this set, which you can, you can think of as, as an image of a four-dimensional uh, space, in, it's, it's like the image of a, of a 4D space in, in, in a 4D space under some polynomial map. Um, sometimes um, this, this uh, the dimension collapses from four to three or two, to, to a lower dimension. But it turns out that the, the only polynomials that do that are the polynomials of this form. These are, precise, these are precisely the polynomials for which um, there's some constraint. For example, if, if you have the addition polynomial, a plus b, a plus b prime, a prime plus b, a prime plus b prime, see, th these four points are constrained. If you, if you know the values of these three numbers, you, you can deduce the value of this one because there's an ident identity. This number is the outstanding sum of these numbers. And so, uh, and so the image of, uh, so it, it, for that particular polynomial, this image is, is a three-dimensional set rather than two-dimensional, uh, rather than four-dimensional. And similarly, you can check that these, 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 other, these other polynomials um, also give you um, some collapse in dimension. But you can prove um, that these are the only ones. And uh, actually, it's a very nice Riemann, Riemann surface argument, actually. You, you, you study when, when the image of the map, when, when the derivative has, uh, doesn't have full rank, and uh, you can actually compute with uh, monodromy. And it's, it's a fun little argument, but uh, I won't give it here. Okay, but if, but if you have the density, um, but if it is density, you can use this lemma. Okay, so, um, so now when we talk about how this lemma is proven,
Now, these definable sets look kind of scary, but fortunately, um, the definable sets in pseudo-finite fields have been classified many years ago. And there's a, there's a very nice description of them uh, due to, uh, so the, the model theorists already worked this out a long time ago. Um, yeah, so um, it's a very nice result of Chester Kodakis, uh, McIntyre, McIntyre, Mendon Dries, which basically says that uh, it, it's called almost quantifier elimination. Um, it's, so it's, it's not quite true that you can get rid of all the quantifiers in the definable set. That would make all the definable sets uh, varieties. And the quadratic residues, for example, are not varieties. So you can't get rid of all the quantifiers. But you can get rid of almost all of them. You can, you can get rid of um, all quantifiers except for one existential quantifier. So it turns out that all definable sets um, must take the form. Um, so in fact, the, um, every definable set Either takes a form like this, where it's, it's sort of a generalized quadratic residue type 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 thing, where it's sort, of, it's sort of all f for which some polynomial of one variable has a root in the in the finite field, or an intersection of finite number of sets of this form, and uh, so every single definable set is is, is of this form. Um, so that's a very nice result. Um, so you can basically. Roughly speaking, you, you can you can reduce to the case where you said E is some set of form B and W, um, and say B plus W, where there exists a T, T and F. Okay, so your your, your definable set, your graph really is, is basically a graph of this form. Okay, now how do you prove how do you prove this this lemma? Um, so this lemma looks kind of complicated, but if you do a single value decomposition. Uh, what you find is, is that what you're really asking is that if you take the indicated function of E, which you can think of as a V by W matrix, okay, with ones and zeros, the adjacent, adjacency matrix of, of, of your graph, what you're really doing in this lemma is that you're splitting it into a bounded rank part plus, a part, plus an error of small operator. Okay, the bounded rank part is what's, what's giving you the decomposition, and the, 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 the error is what's giving you the error term here. Okay, I mean, um, that, that's basically, if you rewrite this in terms of the adjacency matrix, you will see that this is essentially what you're trying to prove. So, how do you prove this? Um, so, uh, thanks to my advisor, Eli Stein, I know what to do in these sort of situations. You, you apply that to the TT star. Um, What you do is that you square the operator, and then you get a square. This is a square matrix, and you do this to get rid of a lot of, you get more cancellation in, in, in this in this matrix, and you try to write this matrix as in the form bounded rank plus small operator norm error, and if you if you know the single value decomposition, if you can prove this, then you can prove this. Although the, the bounds get square rooted, which is why I've got this mi minus one quarter here, where it really should be minus one half, but um, I'll, I'll take the one quarter. Um, so you, can, you, you, you look at, at this matrix instead. Now, what does this matrix look like? The entries of this matrix, let's call them A, W, W prime. Um, cheating a little bit, what this coefficients look like uh, these are counting the number of, of, of points, the number of points in V and T, V and T and T prime, sorry. Where P of V of W T is zero, and P of V W prime T, T prime is zero. Okay, so it's, it's, you, um, you've got some variety, which is depending on both W and W prime in a complicated manner, you're counting the number of points, uh, of F points, of this variety, and that, that is the coefficients of your equation. And so what you want to do is that you want to take this number and you want to write it as the sum of a small error and a main term. And the main term should be low rank in the sense that this, this expression should only depend 
on a bounded number of bits. of information of w and of w prime. That you should, be de you should be able to decompose w and w prime into a finite number of, 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 of buckets, where on each bucket this, this, one, this one is constant. If you can do that, you're, you're done, uh, by, um, basically. So you want to understand this expression, which depends in a, in a coupled way on w and w prime. You want to compute this expression and decouple it so that it only depends on, uh, on uh, well, that after throwing some errors, it, it only depends on a finite, number of a finite amount of information about w and an independent finite amount of information about w prime. So we, you need to start counting lattice points of f points of a variety. So this fortune has also been studied to death. Uh, so um, okay, so the, this expression is, is a coupled expression of w and w prime. Uh, this this variety, but you can think of this variety. This is actually the fiber product of two varieties that depend only on w and w prime. So if you let u w be a set of all vt, so that p of w, v w t is zero, and u w prime defined similarly. Um, these these um, varieties, they live over v, so you, you've got v down here as your base variety, and u w is like some, is some, some sort of covering space lying above v. Here okay, you've got a v here, and then you've got one, one more coordinate, which is your t, and that, that's u w, so you can think of this as some sort of um, cover over W, except it's, it's not quite a cover. There, there, you can have always singular points where it, it doesn't cover properly. But it's, it should be so mostly a cover over, over V. And then you've got this other UV prime, UW prime. And so you've got all these fibers um, above every point. And if you take the Cartesian product of every fiber and you glue it together, you get what's called the, the relative product or, or fiber product of these two varieties. And that's what this thing is. So you want to count the number of lattice points in this, in this, in this variety. And you want to decouple the rows of, of W and W prime. So um, there's a great theorem about how to count uh, points in a, in a finite field over uh, of a variety. So um, there's something called the Langau estimate, which says that if you have some variety U, say, is some d dimensional variety of F, and you want to count how many, how many F points you have. Um, then this is going to be f, f to the d times a constant plus a low order term, d minus one half. And what is this constant? This constant is the number of uh, geometrically irreducible components of u, which are defined over f. Okay, so it, it's, it's some algebraic. Uh, geometric information, basically, so pi naught of, 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 this, of, of this variety. Uh, well, this is defined over F business, but we, um, this is not, this you can do with using the Fabrinius map. This is, this is not such a big, a big deal. But basically, think of it like the number of connecting components of, of, of U, and that is the main term. Of the, so this is a deep theorem. It basically comes from the, 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 the Vey conjectures, um, Lang Vey, or Lang Vau, sorry, Lang Vey, comes from the, um, the Vey conjectures, um, proven by Deleen. But I can just use it as a black box, which is, which is for which I'm very grateful. Um, but okay, so basically, so this expression is uh, so the, the upshot is that you, you want to take the number of connected components. So you want to show that the number of connected components of, of this product um, depends only on. on finally many bits of information, or bounded the many bits of information of both W and W prime. This is, so you've got, you've got one family of curves UW and another family of curves UW prime, and you're taking the, the fiber product, and you're taking this, this complicated object, you're counting connected components, this is some, some integer number, and this number should only depend on some finite amount of information on W and on of W prime. So um, this is finally where the et al. cohomology comes in. So, um, Okay, so um, I said before that the, these, these varieties, UV and, and UW and UW prime, they don't quite, um, morally they're, they're sort of, a, a, they should be a finite level of V, but, but uh, there are singular points. There are, for any W, there's gonna be some singular set, let's call it say sigma W, where, where the fibers do some bad thing, or there's some, something is, is, is degenerate. 
So, but uh, because we're in characteristic zero, uh, those sets, those, those points are not very, are not very uh, prevalent. So you, you can you can show that 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 the, the, the bad points um, uh, uh, have a lower dimension than V itself. So, so up to after after deleting some singular set, these UVs become what's called an, a, an etal finite cover of the set here, which is which is basically um, locally they look they, they look like a, a finite Cartesian product. Okay, so it's, it's the algebraic geometry version of a covering map. So um, after deleting a singular set depending on W and a singular set depending on W prime, um, these things become um, nice finite covers. So you can, uh, if, you, if you delete two singular sets, um, then this is, this is what's called an Atal finite cover. Okay, which is analogous to a, to a covering space uh, in, in, in the topology of manifolds. Now, finally, where does the fundamental group come in? So in topology, um, if you have a connected manifold, and you, you have some finite cover of it, which I am not going to be able to draw. I may do it one-dimensional. Okay. 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 You use me one-dimensional, and then you have, you have some cover, U up here. Then um, and if, if V is connected, the cover doesn't need to be connected. There could be many, many components up here. But you can count how many com components are, are, of U, U you have if you, if you understand the fundamental group. Because uh, V has a fundamental group which acts on fibers. So any point down here has got, so this has got some fiber, some finite fiber here. A pi is bad, okay, C. Okay, some finite fiber. And every loop you have down here, when you lift it, um, and you start from any point in the fiber, you don't necessarily go back to the, the same point in the fiber, but monodromy, you, you might end up in some other point in the fiber. So every loop gives you an action, uh, uh, permutes uh, your, your fiber, and it doesn't, and, and, and it's, it, it's insensitive to homotopy. So, uh, so the fundamental group of the, of the variety acts on the fibers, acts on a fiber. And so you have, this, you have this group acting on this finite set, it will split up this finite set into orbits, and it's easy to see that the number of orbits is equal to the number of components. Um, because if you can on the same component, then there is a loop that connects you. If there isn't, then there's no loop that connects you. So if you understand the fundamental group and you understand how it acts on these fibers, then in principle, you can count connected components. Now, this is what happens with manifolds. Um, we're working with algebraic varieties over um, a pseudo-finite field, as it turns out, which is, um, which is not quite, even those characteristic zeros, it's not really the complex numbers or anything. So um, well, it's not the real number. So you, um, there's no good notion of a loop. So the topological, topological notion of, of a fundamental group doesn't quite make sense. But uh, thanks to the work of Grotendieck and many others, um, there's, um, there's, a, there's a good substitute that's something called the Italian fundamental group, which, uh, which is, uh, if you like, is some sort of abstract nonsense which lets you define um, an object which you call the Italian fundamental group. And what it does is that it, it acts on fibers um, of, of, of coverings in a way which is functorial and, and so forth, which is, which, is, which is nice in various ways. Um, and so this has, um, there's a more established theory of this. It's all in SGA, chapter four, book four, um, which actually was not so scary to read, actually. I was, I was terrified of these books as a graduate student, but actually once you actually have to use them, they're actually not that, not that bad. Um, but, um, well, at least SGA four, I haven't, I'm still terrified of the other uh, books, but okay. Um, but okay, so there's, there's a theory here. So roughly speaking, uh, what, you, uh, what ends up happening is that, is that you need to understand the fundamental group of, um, of the base variety uh, minus these two, uh, with these two single sets removed. And, and the, the, the hardest thing is, is to understand what this fundamental group does. Um, so there's two facts that I actually need um, from SJ4, basically, that I use as black boxes. Um, so one nice fact is that, is that this fundamental group is actually a, what's called topologically finitely generated. So it's, it's not actually finitely generated, but it has a, finitely, a dense finitely generated subgroup. Of it. There's a natural topology, the profinite topology on this, on this group. Um, but it's basically finitely generated, and this, this finitely is what's going to give me my, my finitely many bits of information. Um, so that's one thing I, I can use as a black box. Uh, again, which, and here I use characteristic zero again. 
Um, and the, the other thing that I need is something called the Tau van Happen theorem. So in topology, the Van Kampen theorem, what it does is that if you have, if you have two manifolds and, and prime which overlap at some intersection, and you have some base point here, then you can relate the, the fundamental group of the, of the union to the fundamental group of the two pieces. And it's basically the, uh, the amalgamated free product or co-product of these two groups relative to the fundamental group of intersection. Okay, so it's one of the basic theorems in algebraic topology. Um, and it turns out um, that there is an Atal version, that if you, instead of manifolds you have varieties, then the Atal fundamental group is also a co-product of, 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 um, of varieties. And so the upshot of that is that um, the fundamental group of this object of two singular sets removed can be decoupled into a fundamental group with um, just one of these guys and the other guy. Okay, that you, that you can relate this, this group to, uh, to these two groups. Um, you have to assume that these two, that, that, that these two singular sets uh, intersect each other transversely, but okay, but, uh, but sort of uh, morally speaking, you can, you can decouple this fundamental group into two other fundamental groups, which I don't understand very well, but they are finally generated and they, and they each only depend on one of the two variables. Um, and that's just barely enough information for me to get what I want, which is, which is that this, this expression only depends on finally many, many bits of, of W and W prime. So um, I still don't really understand what these phenomenal groups do, but uh, SGA gives me enough information <laughs> that, I, that I, can, I, can, I can get what I want. Um, and that is, uh, is uh, in fact, the, the end of the proof. So, okay, that's a good place to stop. Yeah.